All right, cool. So, something experimental today. This isn't, I guess that's one way to describe it. Uh, I'm with Jeremy. So, Jeremy, t tell me a bit about yourself. What do you do? Why are you in school? <laughs> well, uh, my name is Jeremy R. Smith. I'm a uh, PhD student in my second year at the uh, Theory Center at Western. Um, I have my BA and MA in uh, Media and Cultural Studies, so a lot of theory has a lot of theory and philosophy has kind of been um, peripheral but yet uh, necessary for some of my research in the past um, and so is the case now um, going into my second year and kind of uh, figuring out what it is I want to do for my dissertation and decided that um, one of the things that uh, I'm interested in for my research particularly is the work of Francois Laruelle, which we'll be discussing today a little bit more in depth. Um, and to kind of discuss the, um, the relationship that he has to uh, political thought, political theory. Um, so a lot of the work that I've done in the past year, um, amateurly translating a lot of work uh, for my own benefit, but lately I also just published uh, with permission from the uh, Laruelle kind of family to uh, bootleg uh, introduction to generic science. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> didn't he say he wanted to be bootlegged or he wanted to be, uh, you know, he didn't care about being... He, he, he likes to be bootlegged. He likes to be hacked. Um, <laughs> I think also it's in the spirit of that book in particular that a lot of the material should be um, like pirated and shared and kind of distributed in a way that is uh, non-institutionally bound. So, and I'm not using non in that sense, like yeah, yeah, yeah. with non philosophy, but <laughs> but ways in which that are uh, you know outside of the uh, uh, normal conventions of um, how knowledge is kind of shared in the first place. So, um, my my research to be very uh, straightforward, um, I'm kind of interested in Laura Wells' notion of uh, politics of invention, and relating that. Uh, the notion of invention to fiction that he draws on in his work. Uh, fiction has an etymological link to invention um, and trying to draw that out uh, through his relationship with Marxism. So I've kind of told, uh, subtitled this work like uh, from post-Marxism to non-Marxism. And a lot of his early works are dealing with the post-Marxist question, drawing from Nietzsche and like Deleuze, Derrida, and a lot of other thinkers in that period. But it becomes a little bit more apparent uh, through his transition to non-philosophy proper that a lot of these uh, terms kind of become latent, as it were, you know, something that uh, uh, you have to draw out and um, express in ways that not a lot of people can relate to immediately. So especially with non-philosophy, what does that mean yeah. in the first place? Um, not a lot of people uh, understand that concept, especially in, in um, contemporary philosophical landscape, or they try to lump him in with speculative realism, for instance, or uh, try to, um, uh, you know, uh, relate all the notions of fiction to a literary genre right you yeah. know and yeah. it, it kind of to make it blunt i feel like it, it sterilizes the work it just like it, it 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 um it loses that power the potency of that work um in relation to uh political theory in the first place so what what i'm interested in is in trying to bring that out a little bit more mm -hmm. yeah because just from you saying that it sounds like these attempts to make his thought at least applicable not only failed to get at the core like what you said but it kind of renders it banal like mm -hmm. like just some kind of like you know like like you said speculative realism something that is probably gaining some kind of speed today mm -hmm. uh but certainly as it's coming up in various literary circles like you yeah. said uh and just being something that we willy-nilly has no real impact in the world but if you want to you know dabble in those kind of dark arts you can go ahead you can have fun <laughs> But it's not going to get you anywhere. So that's that's noble to mm -hmm. try and you know locate his work into a you know a real 
kind of practice. Mm -hmm. Theory is my praxis, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so yeah, summary of non-philosophy. Mm -hmm. This one's a difficult one because it's like, where do you start? Because mm -hmm. you don't start by saying, at least I don't think, by defining what is non-philosophy because mm -hmm. that exa is exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's you know do this first. What exactly does he mean by philosophy if you have you know, an answer to that. Because he, he sketches it as being one thing mm -hmm. and non-philosophy being the thing that kind of, you know, responds to it. Mm -hmm. So, philosophy in, in Laura Wells' terms is a very general kind of notion, but it has a very specific uh, rendering. Um, and one of the questions that um, is always posed to Laura Well is, can't philosophy do this? Can't non, like, what is non philosophy if philosophy already does this? It critiques itself, it deconstructs itself, it seeks to um, do textual analysis or, uh, you know, uh, a genetic or genealogical account or the philosophy of history in a Hegelian sense or anything like that. Um, so, one of the things that Larowell finds, and I think this is a a quasi-technical term like you know think of it as like a Turing machine you know this is a this is a thinker who has all the given material of philosophy it doesn't matter whether or not it's a historical account or you know um, through a genealogical account or anything like that philosophy has a thing that he observes what he calls the principle of sufficient philosophy that philosophy alone can be able to articulate its own kind of account of religion, of history, of sexuality, of technology, and so on and so forth. And it seeks its exit from itself. The the Ausgang in Marxist terms, um, it is only imagining that it's outside of itself. Like it's trying to itself, but it doesn't actually do that. The exit is part and parcel of philosophy. So Laura Well says that um, one of the things that um, questioning this exit, this Ausgang from philosophy, have we ever really entered in philosophy? Have we ever really entered the school of uh, Plato's Academy, as it were? Um, you know, have we really become ge geometrists yeah. <laughs> in that kind of sense? Uh, and I think that uh, philosophy as a term um, is more of a material uh, aspect. It's like, this is, it, it's more of like, you can point to it and look at the text itself or look at the, the, the thought in the work and how it's able to think itself sufficiently um, and how it encloses itself within that kind of own enclosure um, of thought. So philosophy for Laura Well is not so much like um, the thing to destroy, really. It's to think about how to invent new forms of thought alongside or parallel to uh, philosophy's kind of like um, auto-encompassing discipline. Um, so a lot of this non-philosophy is supposed to think through the 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 critique a radical critique of the pr principle of sufficient philosophy um a lot of this uh is related to the notion of a science of philosophy um and laura well has spent over 40 years trying to develop this science of philosophy this is not something that like you know you can just willy-nilly de develop yeah. from like uh, naively, right? You know, you have to mature it over time, and a lot of this is is geared towards um, uh, a coincidence in thought at a moment where difference has become synonymous with uh, the thing that it's critiquing, identity, um, and that it's become a standard form of thought. Uh, and it's always in relation to like the three fundamental terms in philosophy uh, being the other and the one and we'll, we'll probably discuss this a little bit more in depth but philosophy is is 
uh, science and philosophy are the two kernels, as it were. Um, and the thing is, science is not the other of philosophy. Philosophy is the other of science. And I think that um, in its relationship with Marxism, with Nietzsche, and to some extent psychoanalysis, this kind of thing comes to be uh, a symptomological account. Um, so there is a symptom of philosophy, the thing that identifies itself as such, its sufficiency, its positionality, its, its givenness. So that's, that's all I could say about like what is philosophy in, yep. in, in a Laura Willian sense. So um, it doesn't necessarily have a specific uh, kernel except that sufficiency. Yeah. But it's all across the board a generalization. It makes a decision, mm -hmm. as it were. Right. So when Larwell is writing against it, he's a, not just worried with what the limitations that it experiences with itself, mm -hmm. but the kind of audacity that it experiences when discussing anything else. Mm -hmm. Where I feel like he's trying to, you know, get at the heart of you know what philosophy is by critiquing its all you know the kind of recurring ideas that come up whenever it discusses anything, or what he calls a kind of the regional disciplines and sciences mm -hmm. as though you know we can just take this blanket thing called uh, philosophy mm -hmm. that if i'm correct that he says comes to privilege being and the other over mm -hmm. the one mm -hmm. and then takes that as being like the template from which to regard anything else mm -hmm. so for me and this is where if you th if you hear anything i say wrong right. tell me um Larwell seems to be trying to go in reverse mm -hmm. where it's like what can we get from any of these disciplines treating them not as simply you know some otherness to a kind of you know uh, unitary or singular or primate primary being mm -hmm. but as a as a one as a thing in itself yeah and I use the thing in itself so to speak not exactly you know the Kantian way right but what can that then tell us about philosophy mm-hmm uh, See, I don't. That's my kind that's of understanding a, of it. It's it's a very, it's one way of like focusing on it. Um, one of the uh, kernels, uh, one of the um, uh, statements that Laura Well makes in one of his early works is not to destroy philosophy, but to invent it. Um, how does it come to be? Um, and I'm not saying like a condition of possibility in a, a Kantian sense or anything like that. But um, to think through uh, conditions of science um, as a, through a scientific method, as it were, um, to approach philosophy, um, to experiment with it as materials, not so much as like a positive science or anything like that, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I think that if you relate it to a positive science and say, like, you know, there's a culture of philosophy, you know, bacteria, and then you want to mm -hmm. just like investigate it. No. It's more about, like, it's closer to experimental science. Um, a lot of the work that he's uh, drawing from nowadays is quantum physics. And, yep. yep. And dealing with, like, the notion of superposition and entanglement. Um, and um, treating that in, a, a, a like, a non-philosophical way to um, kind of experiment with this material. Um, but also... It's closer to art in a way. Um, I know that like a lot of people look to this artwork kind of uh, uh, perspective, as it were, uh, for um, Laurel's work. Like he has a notion of non-photography, um, relating it to photo fiction and all these other things. So there's a sort of installative, inst installational kind of like uh, aspect to this, um, and. I mean, I could also say, like, there's a sort of Dadaism to it. You yeah. Know, like, uh, um, cutting up uh, one of the words that he uses, although it's related to another thinker named uh, Gilles Gaston Granger, um, uh, Decoupage, uh, you know, sure. like cutting up yep. and everything like yep. that. But it's both an artistic and scientific word. Um, this is something that... Uh, He's done constantly uh, to talk about the cut of the reel, uh, things that cut from um, everything that's been given to create all these new uh, layers of thought. Um, so to go back to this kind of question about uh, regional uh, knowledges and uh, regional um, sciences and everything like that, it's 
it's supposed to be a way of dis- eliminating um, the the authority to any one discipline. Um, one of the things that he discusses is a democracy of thought, uh, a completely equalizing playing field of how uh, all these kinds of neighboring uh, symptomatic kind of relations to the real are in essence, um, you know, uh, equal in the last instance. They are things that uh, you can draw from to develop new experimental ways of thinking. And uh, the, the way in which Laruel tries to raise science up, um, not to like uh, another standard of like thought, it's just that philosophy has an idea of what science is. Heidegger says uh, science doesn't think. Uh, Plato says science dreams. So it's like these are philosophical decisions that have uh, limited the scope of scientific experimentation in thought. So <clears throat> by drawing that up a little bit further, um, you know, everybody, every philosopher has their own version of science too. Like, uh, metaphysics or ontology or um, all these other kinds of ways of thinking in a scientific manner, which is Aristotelian. This is supposed to be a break from Aristotelian thought uh, in a way um, where it's not science as rigorous philosophy. Uh, it's not philosophy as a rigorous science. It's the other way around. It's a science as a rigorous philosophy. Right. So it's it's a way of it looks like philosophy, you know, non philosophy. When you read it, it's like, how is this not, how is this not philosophy? Yeah. But um, of course, that's mimetic. It's uh, it's a something that we we are taught to look into uh, habitually, disciplinarily, and all these other things. But really, though, it's 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 uh, it's um, it's weaker than you think it is. You know, and that's where the the, in my opinion, the political aspect of it comes into play. Um, the way in which it plays with our appearances and our understandings. But we can go a little bit further on, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There's a lot to discuss. There, I mean, there is a lot. So, yeah. okay. How is this different from just a kind of materialism? Mm. So that's a good question. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's a sort of opposition between non-philosophy and materialism uh, from the get-go. Sure. Um, so the thing is, this is in relation to um, a Marxist materialism in a way. Yeah. Um, it seeks to start from uh, the concrete to the, uh, the abstract, or rather the other way around, or whatever. I don't know. I'm a bad Marxist. <laughs> um, but it, it's a way of like uh, starting from real kernels of reality. Um, and I know that like when you look at abstract gobbledygook and thinking like, oh, this is, this is not real. This is just words on a page. I think that if you were to try to treat... Um, um, the content of what he's dealing with, um, mainly philosophy or science or you know, all these other disciplines, um, they are material. They are, you know, given aspects from all these other disciplines. Um, one of the things that kind of strikes me in um, this relationship between uh, non-philosophy and materialism um, is that um, it goes back to one of his works, uh, the minority principle, the principe de minorité. Um, my French is horrible too, so we're going to get a lot of that today. <laughs> um, so this this book, um, Ray Brassier has translated one chapter or one subsection in that book as uh, the decline of matter in the name, uh, the decline of materialism in the name of matter, and I think that. Um, Laurel's work is a type of realism, um, but it's a way of appropriating the Marxist concept of determination in the last instance, which is um, rem uh, like 
in an Althusser's language, it's uh, the base determines this, the uh, the superstructure uh, in the last instance. So think of it like as an architectural metaphor, um, as Althusser does of a two story house or a building. The base, the the the, the level of foundation, and everything like that. But the last instance for Laruelle is completely devoid of empirical and known objects. Um, it's supposed to be this void, not of nothingness, but of like an invariant, something that is indeterminate. Uh, so in, you know, like uh, it, this, this is where the quantum physics comes into play, you know, like indeterminate matter or, you know, something like the uh, indeterminacy principle in uh, uh, Heisenberg. But um, the, the relationship that I find between non-philosophy and materialism is about this indeterminacy, this last instance that um, has its own radical autonomy. Like um, the problem that I find per se is, um, is related to um, the notion of matter. Um, in materialism and I think it's just that as a term a lot of people have misunderstood this uh, in Laura Wells kind of scope in the first place uh, I know a lot of Marxists for instance uh, I'm, I like the guy I don't want to like you know <laughs> but um, uh, Jay Mufawad Paul has a book called uh, continuity and rupture and has done a review of um, introduction to non-Marxism by Laura Well um, and I get the feeling that the reason why he has such a critique of Laura Well in the first place uh, on the notion of matter is because Marxism was in the title. <laughs> yeah. And I don't necessarily want to uh, 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 um, uh, hinder that guy's career or anything. He's a, he's a wonderful <laughs> scholar. And it, it, you know, uh, it's just that like when you look at it through uh, a lens of Marxism and not actually as, look to take a step back outside of that. The notion of matter does not, uh, it, it's, it's unchangeable. Um, so the notion of matter in, in Marxism is things that are concrete, yeah, you yeah. know? And I think that with regards to non-Marxism, it's about indeterminacy and how that could be used in a Marxist landscape. And I think that if if that was actually looked into uh, with the minority principle and also elaborated a little bit further on in a lot of the secondary works on Laruel, you might be seeing something different. Um, sure. A lot more uh, better interpretations of this work, but like I said, this, it's hard because this is this yeah. is forty years of material that you can't like. Uh, not a lot of has been translated in the first place, so yeah, it, it's that's the difficulty of it all. I was speaking to a friend of mine, and he was saying like, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of an aside, but mm -hmm. when he was reading Laura Well, he felt like he was dropped like media in media res, like. <laughs> and how I said it, I was like, I'm halfway through a movie that I, I didn't see the first half, like I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean we can't pick up the pieces here. No. Um, so, okay. what Now non-philosophy. Mm -hmm. What What is it trying to do? Mm -hmm. Well, that's always a good question. I feel like a lot of these are good questions. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to speak about because a lot of it is in written notion. Sure. You know, uh, a lot of us are very accustomed to have something written down, yep. you know, um, for instance, the textual elements of it, the hyphens and the brackets, uh, you know, the yeah, bracketing yeah, yeah. of intentionality yeah. and everything yeah, like yeah. that, you know, it's a visual cue. So a lot of this is not directly communicated. And I think that like, that's the, that's a difficulty. So, yeah. um, when people speak about this, it's, it's hard for one to recognize that this is one looking to uh, break from um, all-encompassing thought. Like, not everything has to be, you know, thought in one manner. It has to be thought in several manners. One way of thinking of this is uh, his wife, uh, Anne-Francois Schmid, has a notion of collective intimacy. Okay. Uh, where 
a scientist, a philosopher, an artist, some other people can come together and subtract from their discipline um, what makes up their discipline in the first place. So it's looking to kind of remove or equalize the playing field of thought, as it were, democracy of thought. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way of doing it. The second, and this is part and parcel why I feel as though this is related to Marxism in a way, though it strikes me as a very academic way of doing it, yeah. um, unfortunately, which is the, uh, the liberation of knowledges. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, that Laurel liked to be hacked, he liked to be bootlegged, he liked to be uh, pirated and all these other things. Yeah. Like, um, I think that the way in which theory or, you know, philosophy has kind of been institutionalized or used um, for um, uh, uh, neoliberal kind of like academia as it is nowadays, um, has been kind of like squandering how we actually use that work in everyday life. Um, not so much in like, oh, how are you going to use this as a philosophy degree or anything like that? No. What is it about the work that gives a liberating feeling in the first place? You know, everybody gets this ecstatic feeling when they read something that like they get pleasure out of, but also listening and performing the work as it were through anything, you know, it's a matter of liberating those kinds of things to be practiced in everyday life. And I think that one of the things that comes to mind is, uh, you know, Marx and Engels is German ideology where they say in communist society, um, a man can be uh, a fisherman, a, 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 a rear cattle in the afternoon, you know, a, philo a critic as he has a mind in the evening without being a fisherman, uh, a yeah. rearer cattle, or a, a critic. Yeah. Um, and this kind of comes to mind with like collective intimacy, you know, like one could be a philosopher, artist, or scientist without becoming one. Yeah. Um, and I think it also gives us a sense of freedom for who we want to be, not who we can be or who we should be, but who we want to be. Like, you know, not to have permission to like do the, the, the things that we do in the first place. It's, it's something that we seek to kind of liberate for ourselves as, you know, using the contents that we have. Um, that's how I see it at least. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, a lot of people have different interpretations of like, how non-philosophy has kind of done you better in the world <laughs> but like it, it gives a sense of like uh, a, a freedom that's already there you know um, that uh, it, it, it just doesn't have that um, nowadays with regards to like how academia works you know people are trained to be the who, the who they should be in life or who they can be in life yeah not who they want to be yeah so it's it's a matter of liberating these kinds of things in the first place, mm -hmm. you know. So that presents uh, my one of my first. It's not a concern, but like mm -hmm. a point of clarification. Where it seems as though non philosophy is proposing that philosophy is too much plagued by its own logic of sufficiency, mm -hmm. it's, it, by too much by its own desire to, you know, approach the world in a very tautological way. Mm -hmm. It only knows how to do it the way it knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. So it, in that sense, it's kind of, it's a total system, mm -hmm. right? It's one that sees things in, only through its own lens. Mm -hmm. But then he's proposing this non-philosophy, mm -hmm. one that's guided by the logic of the one, mm -hmm. and you could clarify that because there's probably some you know nuance into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. A logic of the one that seems to be in itself a kind of totalism, mm -hmm. totalism or totality. Mm -hmm. How do they differ? So I think that this is a good question. Again, good questions all around. I'm going to be like probably saying this a lot. Um, so the thing is, I think that this comes down to the notion of um, totality of lived experience and the totality of like accumulative knowledge. Um, and where that kind of knowledge or where that cognition, where that intuition goes, what is it for? If it's an auto enclosing, if like if it's an auto enclosing kind of surface of non of philosophy, 
why isn't non-philosophy the same way? I think as, as I've kind of put the pieces together uh, through my readings and everything like that, um, lived experience is the term that Laura Well kind of points to. It's um, vécu, um, which in French could mean lived experience in the phenomenological philosophical sense or something that's lived, as in like the past participle, you know, something that has been already given. So the thing is, um, what is already given is like the material, like philosophy. It has its knowledges of universals, um, power, language, sexuality, history. These are all universals of philosophy uh, in a way. I mean, a lot of a lot of the thinkers would disagree with this, but this is a very generalized scope. Um, whereas lived experience is kind of like the bits and pieces, the symptoms of, of the imminence of humankind in these kinds of different disparate universals. The point is to kind of extract them like kernels, you know. Um, so the problem is of the ones totalizing or the ones kind of like uh, uh, unifying tendency or anything like that. I think that the difference uh, that kind of connotes the non-philosophical one with the notion of unity in, in, uh, not, uh, in philosophy, the one in non-philosophy is kind of like this flattening, this collapse of... of um, multiple different kinds of things. Um, it, it removes the, the notion of a, a, a transcendent one, it removes the, the notion of one's equation with being or one's equation with the other. It seeks to kind of displace and, uh, and ooh, this displace and emplace or mm. displace and kind of like implant the, yeah. the um, kinds of tendencies towards a new destination. Yeah. And I, I think that like a destination as opposed to a destiny, uh, a telos is kind of like a, a, a way of recognizing that once this is removed, the sufficiency from all these different disciplines is removed. There's a way of gravitating towards the one in a way that makes it so that it's more fluid, yeah. makes it more, uh, you know, practical in a way that is not so much about like an enclosure where philosophy kind of accumulates these kinds of things. It to like the, the notion of totalization and totality have been, um, I, I feel like misguided from like the philosophies of difference um, where it's kind of like, don't totalize, don't do this. Like it's unethical. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't, don't account, like it doesn't account for all. No, the thing is totality, it, it finds a new life in non-philosophy. It seeks to um, use these things uh, to totalize in a way that is not supposed to be like the fear that a lot of people have in the first place. It kind of extra totalizes. It kind of does this extra, extra territoriality. Um, and it's no, it, it's, it's no, uh, no surprise that like Laura Well uses the term like alien and stranger subject to kind of like give this alienating experience to thought, you know, Something that is alien to thought right now is letting this go, letting letting all of this go to like this kind of unified force. Yeah. Um, and he uses the phrase "force of thought," and "of" is in brackets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's related to um, uh, labor power and Marx um, and Engels, who just Marx generally in capital, but like labor power in French is "force de travail." but like in, in hyphenation or anything like that. But, yeah. Uh, force of thought is meant to be a way of looking at the productive forces that kind of determine in the last instance, this totality, this unity, all these kinds of things that philosophy seeks to kind of like capture it as it's all. Um, so the thing is, there's, there's the one and then there's the all. In Deleuze, it's a one all. Like, there is no distinction between them. Sure, yeah. Um, but this is kind of, it's it's a weird form of monism, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, 
but it's not a monism in a way. Like it, like it's it is, but it isn't. Yeah, you know. Um, so this one becomes something um, inalienable, indivisible, not something that can be divided. Mm-hmm. With unity, there is already impl- an impl- implicit notion of division. Yeah. So this is a notion of unification. This is a thing that, like, in a way, um, in generic science, uh, he talks about idempotence, yeah. equal power, pretty much. Um, but it's kind of like an idempotent algebra. An algebra, if you look at like the, the etymology, etymology is a, is a fun thing, but I don't like to resort to it as an essential point of view. But algebra is the reunification of broken parts. You know, if you think of an idempotent algebra, it is completely uh, one plus one equals one. There's no yep. like yep. Yep. additive kind of force to it. All of it's equalized. Mm-hmm. So, how does one get to a democracy of thought? How does one actually get to this democracy practiced without it being related to parliamentarianism or you know? Uh, the notions of democracy that we have nowadays you know? yeah yeah uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a new way of thinking in my opinion like mm-hmm. um okay so i th- you might want to correct me on this but mm. this is how i imagined it mm. uh comparing the kind of totality present in philosophy mm-hmm. versus the kind of universalism of non-philosophy mm-hmm. if i can use those terms in that way okay just for this moment yeah um for me i understood it as being in the case of philosophy, it tells everything what, you know, this is the kind of spectral light we're going to place you under, mm-hmm. and you're going to, you know, um, acquiesce, you're going to submit to it. Mm-hmm. Whereas non-philosophy, and I, this is how I understood it, with a kind of the experimental or scientific approach, mm-hmm. sought to see what is almost consistent in among all the fields that, mm-hmm. in a sense, bring them together mm-hmm. by their own volition, not something that's imposed, but something that kind of exists under the surface. Mm-hmm. At least that's how I understood the one. Mm-hmm. So that's the, that's the first thing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But then, next thing is, where he's kind of, constru- obviously, constructing a difference between non-philosophy and philosophy. Mm-hmm. He seems to look under non-philosophy as being one dominated by a logic, dominated is a rough word, mm-hmm. but that kind of portends the logic of a unilateral duality, mm-hmm. as opposed to, and I don't think he says it anywhere, but I'm assuming that's just in Stark contrast to a dialectic, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I don't know what. The, and what do you think about that? Okay, so those are okay. So I'm going to try to answer both of these questions. Cool. Um, so the first is about uh, universalization and totality. Um, to go back to these kinds of like um, distinctions, as it were. I think that. Um, one of the things is about um, the, the 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 use of hyphens and brackets in this way. Yeah. Um, uh, like I said, I think the one of the weaknesses of uh, non philosophy is its textual kind of approach to things, and whether or not this is kind of a, a remainder of Derrida's influence on uh, Alara Well, it's uh, it's a whole other. F- did did as an aside, did he have a big influence on him? Uh, yes. So the. Um, to be very quick, the entire so there is like five periods of non-philosophy okay. that have been developed over forty years. Yeah. Um, and well, I, I would argue that there is six, but you know, I, I think that like uh, Laura Well doesn't really care about these numbers anymore. It's just it's just stupid. Um, uh, so in, in this early period, which is like from nineteen seventy five to nineteen eighty. Um, you know, philosophy one. Um, he's got uh, five books, four of which are more um, uh, fundamental. The first one of his books is uh, a book on Ravaison's ontology. Um, Ravaison being uh, a philosopher of habit and um, very influential on like uh, Deleuze and um, and um, uh, Malibu, for instance. Um, but the um, the works that are in question are very heavily um, tech- about textuality. Um, so uh, these works are uh, one is called Textual Machines, which is like a, right. a critique of Derrida using Deleuze's kind of work, 
which is not to make it compatible with each other. It's more of like, how does one do a methodical approach to both? Yeah. Um, so uh, he, he comes up with like a pseudo particle collider of like a, a series of between a Deruz and a Delida. Uh, I use this like picture, uh, two pictures in a presentation recently of like um, two characters from Dragon Ball Z just doing a fusion and just like imagining yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. Uh, uh, what uh, you know um, Deleuze and Derrida would look like if they put Batara earrings or yeah Vegito uh, yeah exactly so um, uh, that was one of those books um, where he has like a notion between textual textuel and atextual. And I think the textual and the atextual are kind of elements that were in Derrida and Deleuze um, that he kind of brought to the fore a little bit further um, to kind of question Derrida's authority over the linguistic representation of the text, which I feel is like still heavily riddled in this kind of like work. Um, a second book in that is uh, The Decline of Writing. Uh, which was followed by interviews with Derrida, Jean-Luc Nancy, Sarah Kaufman, and uh, uh, Philippe Le Coulibarth, I think. Yeah, I think that's all of them, uh, which was kind of a usage of uh, uh, Nietzsche uh, in a way that is um, very interesting. Uh, he comes up with the notion of a minor writing alongside of like a minor literature in, in the sense of like Deleuze and Guattari's book on Kafka. Sure. Uh, but treating that in the lens of Derrida's notion of writing in a way that is like unreadable uh, to, according to Jean-Luc Nancy. Like it's, there is no readability to this text. It looks like you're stoned yeah. is what he said in the yeah. interview. Um, in one of the interviews. Uh, third book, uh, Nietzsche contra Heidegger which um, seeks to set up a quadripartite of uh, um, four positions in Nietzsche's work, which um, is a very, I, I think that the, a lot of these books are like somewhat controversial in uh, the history of like, you know, of his work in a way, um, because this one in particular, he is saying that Nietzsche is both a fascist and a revolutionary thinker. <laughs> and, um, that there's nothing wrong with the Nazis interpreting Nietzsche. There's nothing wrong with that. They are falsifiers, but there's nothing wrong with that, is what he's saying. It's what they do with the text. It's what they work with Nietzsche in the first place that matters. Um, so the, the notion of usage is all throughout, uh, is littered throughout all of his entire corpus. Like, how does one use the materials from philosophy to go beyond it? Yeah. And the last book is Beyond the Power Principle, which is also a very controversial text because uh, it's actually one of my favorites, um, mainly because it was the first book I roughly translated. But in that book, he's trying to treat the notion of power. Uh, how does one move from the meaning of power to the power of meaning? And how does one liberate meaning in French et sens? So, um, uh, it, it shares the same uh, uh, link with sense. Uh, so there's uh, meaning, sense, and signification. And how does meaning get liberated from sense and signification? And how does it remove itself from um, uh, how one thinks of power in the first place? Um, so uh, two things from those texts, and then to go back to these kinds of things, um, if, we could, if you could rephrase the questions when I go back to them. Um, uh, is that Marxist and Freudian politics belong to the prehistory of politics alongside aristocratic and bourgeois politics is one of the things that he says, uh. which I think is a very <laughs> profound statement yes, and yes. very, very, very true. Yeah. Um, and in order for us to actually move past these kinds of things in the first place, one needs to, to, to uh, uh, go with the route that Laura Well is dealing with. Um, and the other is that um, a, a quote from, and I know the page number right off the top of my head, page 140 of Beyond the Power Principle. Uh, Even in the seventh circle of hell, fascism, there remains a rebellious postulation. Sure. Um, it's not so much to mean that like one finds a positive or negative aspect in fascism to use 
as if like uh, Laura Well was a fascist sympathizer, but rather that like what is it about fascism? Not about its badness or goodness or I don't even want to say goodness because it's obviously bad. It's horrible. Um, what about it that we need to move past in, in, in our relations of politics and our relations of power in the first place? Yeah. And um, and what do we do with that? What do we use it for? What it like? It might sound alienating to a lot of uh, um, anti-fascist sympathizers like myself and like everything like that, but it, it is a very provocative statement. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of this is related to the kind of questions that you've asked already, like the notion of totality and universalization. To kind of go back to this, <laughs> yeah, 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 like I think I think that um, a, a totality would be saying, oh no, we got to bracket off, like it, it can't touch fascist thinkers. You can't like. I, I know for several years Nietzsche was like blacklisted in um, in France because he was quote unquote a Nazi sympathizer. But you know this, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is this is what happens when you have a sister who um, takes over your estate. You know, um, but the thing is, um, I think the 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 notion of universalization allows for. Um, in non-philosophy to kind of materialize the, the, the kinds of givens that are given throughout um, different iterations, dinner, different universals of philosophy, you know, like, uh, like I said before, language, history, sexuality, power, and all these other things. And to kind of like start from a basis of impoverishment, like the one is without clothes. It's kind of like, you know, it, 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 it it's, it's, it's not woven a fabric. It doesn't provide the conditions of possibility. It's just absolute, like radical impoverishment. Uh, it's destituted. It's um, uh, dispossessed and everything like that. Um, and it's void of all empirical and given contents. So uh, the notion of the one in philosophy also just loses its kind of like uh, in clothing, as it were. You yeah. Know? Um, so. It, it starts from this notion of radical impoverishment. Um, and I think that it's useful to think that way, uh, especially to kind of like work through um, what has been given to kind of start to think this radical impoverishment, to think also <clears throat> moving towards a better situation for the world. And the world is usually capitalized. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, there's a thought world, there's a research world, there's a, uh, all these different types of worlds according to non-philosophy. But the thing that determines a world is between authority and minority and that the world kind of divides these kinds of things. It's not a matter of uh, dividing constantly. Um, there's a, a, a Maoist saying of the one divides into two and the two unifies into one. The one for Laura Well does not divide. It's just a very inseparable kind of like element that unifies all these kinds of things in the first place. Yeah. And um, to kind of use that sort of uh, uh, textual metaphor a little bit further, um, you know, text, textile, fabric, all these kinds of things. It's gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about undoing those kinds of things mm-hmm. to kind of look for the, the hidden knots and to follow like uh, um, a kind of like uh, Ariadne's thread uh, of work to kind of tether and develop new ways of get mapping and navigating this world that is hell, pretty much. Yes. Um, the second question, uh, remind me of the second question again, I'm sorry. Uh, we're you, dealing with, I think it was the unilateral. Oh, unilateral duality, duality and how it is distinct from dialectic. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Um, so unilateral duality is um, a phrase that first appears um, in um, a minority principle uh, and gets developed over time. Uh, so it's kind of a way of thinking about causality in a different way. Um, unilateral means one-sided. Um, but this one-sidedness um, is also an irreversible causality. So there's a sort of, um, um, in philosophy, there are four types of causalities, uh, the formal, the material, the effective, and the, um, the final. Um, and 
these are present causes, and then there's the absent cause of Marxism or psychoanalysis and like Lacan or Althusser and everything like that. But um, uh, there's a saying by Althusser that the last instance is uh, it never comes. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it takes that very quite seriously uh, in non-philosophy. Laura Wall uses this determination in the last instance to kind of like formalize um, a way of thinking of radical autonomy. Um, unilateral duality is um, holding two terms in suspense, the philosophical and the scientific, um, and that um, this kind of relationship between the two is uh, obviously held in suspense, but they're equalized by the one. It's meant to be um, a way of thinking of who or what this causality is in the first place, and no surprise, uh, I feel like this would cue him in to be anthropocentric or, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, a humanist or anything like that. But he says man is this last instance that determines science and philosophy. Um, but who is man? Who is the one? Like all these sure. kinds of things, yeah. you know. It implies this sort of um, um, way of thinking that I, I, I think is not stranger to, to Marxism in a way. Um, that uh, it's that life determines consciousness and it's not the other way around. It's yeah. like, um, it's a manner of thinking that starts from this positionality that has been uh, thought of as the end of man, the death of man and everything like that. But that he distinguishes between that and the anthropological kind of like sure. connotation of man. So. A lot of this is related to um, how does one think of humankind, humanity, and um, you know the notion of man without its gender, its sexual, historical, cultural, racial, kind of like all these different kinds of things in the first place. Um, and in a way to hold all these kinds of things that have been given through science, through philosophy, in suspense. Yeah. Um, one of the terms, it, it, unilateral duality would later become unified theory. And then from unified theory, it would be um, yeah, the quantum entanglement of things, like uh, uh, wave and particle kind of like distinctions. Sure. Um, so it, it, this kind of term is, you know, one can juggle as many terms as they want. Either way, there is going to be unilateral causality of things. The duality is just, I guess, a simplistic way of Larwell to kind of treat these kinds of uh, generalities in a way that lumps them together. Yeah. So um, I think it's a simplicity uh, for duality or dualism in this way, but not so much of a duel as in like a, a combat between the two. Yeah. So the duel would be the dialectic kind of struggle to resolve and reach a conclusion, but you know, nobody nobody actually reaches a conclusion in a dialectic. Um, there's a very funny line, uh, and stop me if I'm like going on rambling a little bit, but um, there's a funny line in a lecture that he gave about like class struggle and how he says that unlike a football match where the referee signals the end of the match, class struggle does not end Sure. You know, it, it, people want it to end. Yeah, they they yeah. want the, the struggle to end. And I don't think that's... Laura Welt does not want that struggle to end because if you think of it as an end, then you've already presupposed that limitation. You've already said, like, this is what it ends up like. But it's, it's about struggling and working through these kinds of limitations and reaching not an end, but, like, a new transformation, a new destination of thought. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so the duality is not meant to be like a duel or like a, a thing where things are in conflict with one another um, or struggling for recognition or, you know, master-slave dialectic or anything like that, but really held in suspense, yeah, uh, equalized on a playing field. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that the, the notion of the unilateral duality is... Um, it's got its core in Hegel in a way. Um, okay. The, 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 the notion of one-sidedness. Uh, I, 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 I can kick like or something like that. 
but it's like the notion of one side. Okay. Uh, but like this is no a notion of sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there is no sovereignty in the cultural sense of the term uh, of the one. Yeah. But it's kind of like this unilateral unilateral body, um, which doesn't have like a physical body or anything that it doesn't have a cultural manifestation yeah um so so that gives him the possibility to say things like it's non-phenomenal it doesn't fit into like a phenomenological tradition it's Mm -hmm. Mm non-intuitive and because the world is guided by you know making things fucking intuitive yeah making them you know apparent it is in that sense stranger it doesn't belong to the world yet it is part of it yeah like it it haunts It, it yeah yeah so it's it's also non cognitive in a way. Yeah. It, like the yeah. notion of unintelligibility should not also be related to a cognitive sense, but an intuitive sense. Right. Um, so this is both for and against Kant and Deleuze in a way, you know, like or Spinoza and Kant or anything like that. So it's it's a a manner of holding those two in suspense, uh, cognitive uh, relations and as well as intuitive relations. Um, and yeah, the notion of the stranger, the the foreigner, the uh, the alien. These are all subject positions for Laura Well in a way that is not meant to be like some sort of uh, um, uh, heralding or um, um, putting on a pedestal kind of thing, but more of like this is who we are every day in in this world. Yeah. Um, and without kind of like the real. Um, thing that we have to struggle like it's a thing that we have to struggle not to recognize as ourselves but uh to reckon with through our relationship with the world as lo- at large so. right and it, and it does that or it thinks as he says without constituting a system mm-hmm. so is is system you know prima facie negative for lara <laughs> well or I, I shouldn't say negative but like is it something that belongs to the realm of philosophy that he's trying to get at or trying to problematize yeah so i think that a lot of the uh the funny things and this comes up with like um uh introduction to generic sciences he says you know it's kind of like a program but we will say this is not a program you know like the famous like uh uh uh, statements that a lot of revolutionaries or uh, rebels make like this is not a program yeah uh, this is not uh, a, the, the revolution will not be televised um, uh, all these kinds of things like in the first place so I think the system the notion of a system implies that there is a sort of division of labor that, sure. that people yeah. like parts and cogs and a yeah. machine you know like all these different kinds of things so a system for Laura Well is not so much what it is. Um, there is a really funny mishap in translation that um, happened while I was at the Theory Center with a bunch of people, and um, I was translating this uh, text that he wrote on Le- uh, Levinas, and uh, one of the lines in French is "plompier," uh, which like means like same foot, but. Uh, I didn't know what it meant, so I had to tr- like Google what it meant. And it, it translated it as bungalow. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, like a bungalow of uh, of uh, being, a bungalow of philosophy, a bungalow of non philosophy. All these kinds of things. Like, just think of like a one floor building yeah, yeah, yeah. as a way of like f- formulating this. That's um, funny. Uh, so, I think that um, I think that like uh, a bungalow as opposed to a system would be a, a better way of phrasing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, it's mo- mostly joking, but like, um, it, it implies this sort of individuality mm-hmm. uh, to um, kind of like somebody's like housing situation or whatever, you know. But it's simple. It's simplistic. You know, um, there's a sort of. Uh, um, uh, like a cutting of the Gordian knot uh, that a lot of systems would put into place in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, this, the, the notion of a systematic formulation in non-philosophy, I think that like he has provided a blueprint for these kinds of ways of thinking, but um, even then it's not systematic in a way. It's, yeah. kind of, it's more methodical, more practical. It's, 
it's more of a, a discipline approach mm -hmm. to um, working with these materials. So as opposed to a system, it's kind of like starting from the pre-system, pre-kind of organizing and everything like that. So um, yeah, it's not systematic in a way. I mean, like you could say that like there's a sort of like construction site in the works. Yeah. But people are using the uh, um, the metal bars as monkey bars. So mm -hmm. that's how I would view it. You know, it's more of a playground for thought. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the last question I have about this, but doesn't mean the last thing we discuss about it, mm -hmm. uh, deals with the clone. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That for me, and I think this is going to feed well into the generic science when he gives us this discussion about idempotence, mm -hmm. where there's almost, like you said, the one plus one equals one. Mm -hmm. Like the, the clone doesn't add anything per se, mm -hmm. but it adds something in that it reveals that not everything needs to necessarily add something. Right. If, if I can put it in those terms, mm -hmm. where he says, he says that the, the clone is the real transcendental but indivisible identity of, in brackets, mm -hmm. a philosophical double. Mm -hmm. what, is he, what is he giving us with this? What, 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 what is that? A philosophical double. Um, so I think this is also meant to be um, uh, an argument against a lot of different um, thinkers at once. So people that come to mind are Girard on the mimetic rivalry, Sure. Uh, Lacan on uh, the semblant um, or the semblance and um, Hegel with the master-slave dialectic. I think that with regards to all three of these instances, you have um, a notion of recognition of mimicry and all these other things. And this is to kind of like circulate back what is non-philosophy if it looks like non-philosophy? What does it do if it yeah. does things like philosophy? And I think that like the this notion of a mimeticism um, is 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 a good thing. It's not meant to be a bad thing. Yeah. And I think that like this is meant to be um, a non-Platonic kind of way of conceiving things. So Plato has his whole tirade against mimetic poetry, uh, as opposed to like poetry in its narrative or. Um, not true form or like something like a, a, I forget Plato this is obviously not my forte but um, mimeticism is a bad thing for Plato sure uh, yeah like the, the cave I think alludes to that yeah you know, we, we're not dealing with this simulacral yeah. crap we gotta yeah. get to the essence of the yeah, yeah 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 but it, it's also related to the simulacrum in a way like you know uh, the notion of the clone has a simulacral power to it yeah um, and it, it, it kind of implies a sort of uh, um, a political aspect to it. Um, so the clone, to kind of go back to this, I think it's like it's meant to be um, non-additive and non-subtractive. Um, so like it seems to me that a clone in a lot of sci-fi literature implies like your body's been stolen, this body snatcher or anything like that, or the thing, you know, yeah, literally sure. inhabiting the body and mimicry, all these other things. Like, I, I think that Laruel is toying with this idea in a way that is uh, science fiction based, um, but not in a literary sense. Like, this is about inventive possibilities, uh, inventive destinations for how one thinks of subjectivity, how one thinks of... Um, uh, the way in which one is in, in life. So the clone is meant to be um, a double without a sort of like speciality to it, like a specialness or uniqueness or anything like that. But it implies a sort of individual, but uh, at the same time, indivisible kind of entity. Yeah. Um, we're all, in some way, shape, or form, clones of something, you know, not a, it, there's a sort of, like, um, parental kind of, like, thing that goes on with, uh, um, Larwell's work, um, 
mother and father and everything like that. But like he's not implying some sort of biological birth of the clone or anything like that. The clone is meant to be. Um, I'm trying to think of how to think of it this way. The clone is meant to be um, a material subjectivity that one develops out of the things that have been given. Um, so it takes on an appearance of a philosopher, it takes on the appearance of a scientist, it takes on the appearance of a, an artist, all these kinds of like uh, uh, subject positions or anything like that. But really though, um, the essence of the clone is, is something that is unified with what has preceded it. Um, the clone is meant to be like not so much an extension or anything like that, but it is it is a transcendent kind of like being uh, from the real. Yeah. Um, but in essence, the philosophical double, it's it's a playful term. I think you know it's meant to like scare the shit out of uh, a philosopher. <laughs> I think um, I think uh, in ways that like. Uh, it also reminds me of a rigor eye in a way, you know, um, uh, her form of mimeticism and, and looking to subvert the, uh, phallo logocentric kind of like, um, um, way of perceiving woman. Yeah. And I don't think it's any different from that in a way. Okay. But, but this is meant to be a, uh, non-gendered identity like a non-cultural identity or yeah. anything like that. So it kind of frees up that subject position to a way that is not necessarily linked to sexual, gender, race, and all these other things. Yeah. Um, things that have been decided upon by the world through all this division in the first place. A clone does imply division, but it's not a division in a way that removes yourself. Sure. Or it removes any essence scare quotes of yourself from the world yeah so. yeah that yeah that makes sense to me yeah um all right so now i'll turn it to you and then mm. i'll leave you to decide if there's anything else about this piece or about non-philosophy generally mm. that you think we haven't touched on that you think is like at you know, the current pertinent. Ugh. well i mean um i think that uh when it comes to a lot of the, the Laura Well works, um, especially the in, interpretation and uh, the publication and all these other things, um, and I think this is a good platform for this in the first place, um, to kind of generalize the audience. You know? Sure. Like, even though theory and philosophy, <laughs> you still have to have, like, some sort of knowledge in yeah, some, yeah, yeah, in some yeah, regards. Yeah. But I, I think that, like, uh, um, when you have an audience that has been mostly academics and, and working on these kinds of things, um, it limits the amount of attention that one can give um, elsewhere. Um, and I think that one of the difficulties that I have with that is uh, that Laura Well in Struggle and Utopia talks about these four uh, five subject positions of non-philosophers. There's academics, there's mystics, there's yeah. heretics, there's uh, analysts in the psychoanalytic tradition, sure. and, there, and then there are um, uh, uh, militants. So these come up to be what I call, like uh, I've called it a couple of times, uh, red stars in the black universe. So uh -huh. they're kind of like equalized points on a star yeah. um, that uh, could work towards developing uh, this work to be more approachable for everybody to utilize in yeah. their everyday lives and not in the sense of utilization and like, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, like you got to do this or whatever, <laughs> you yeah. know, 12 uh, rules for life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's not like meant to be like a self help kind of thing. It's more like, you know, how does one achieve a fusion of theory with the masses? Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that Marx uh, predicated upon in um, the second thesis on Feuerbach, uh, you know, uh, the fusion of theory and practice, the th fusion of theory and reality, in a way that like it there is no there is a relationship between the two, and that if there it, the the assumption that 
they are separated from each other is a scholastic question for Marx and it's an academic question for me. Yeah. Uh, to assume that there's a split. Um, and I think that a lot of academics presume this split. They presume that um, we have this institutionalized concrete wall. Yeah. Um, what do we do about liberating the things that, that, that are actually behind walls, behind firewalls, behind all these kinds of research badges and everything like that? Yeah. What do we do uh, to remove the commodification of such knowledges in the first place? Uh-huh. How do we make it so that it's practical and useful for people to utilize against their fascist interlocutors or even more importantly, like uh, not... Um, uh, you know, having uh, they're, they're like means. They're they're the means to an end in a way. Um, so, what I'm saying is, in essence, like academics have been, uh, and I say this in the uh, translator's preface to the uh, my my bootleg version of uh, introduction to generic sciences that the academics have been the Stella Maris of the ship. Yeah, you know, um, they've been like uh, pointing to this like uh, north star a- in the sea where there is all this wreckage coming from that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. like, uh, what can we do about like the other four other subject positions and how do we raise them up to not the same level, but equalize them all in, in this last instance of the black universe, as it were. Yeah. How does this shimmer and how does it give hope in a way that like um, does not uh, render any sort of like mode of like resistance or revolution weak or yeah. moot mm-hmm. you know um, and what can we do what is to be done with this non-philosophical material that we've been given yeah um, so uh, it, it's no surprise for me like I, I have this conviction to kind of work through these uh, uh, um, problems um, uh, of subject positions and kind of like hold uh a lot of the academics accountable, <laughs> even though I myself am an academic, you yeah. know, uh, but it's how does one deep, deep potentialize or uh, deep positionalize that, that position in the first place? How does one do these kinds of things? And I think non-philosophy allows me to do that, but it's also about raising these other things up to the same caliber, the uh-huh. same level. So I have yet to see a real non-academic text. <laughs> so I have I have yet to see um, a non-textual form of non-philosophy, and I have yet to see um, a form of non-philosophy that is not appealing to some sort of authority. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the uh, attempts that non the non-philosophers have is use the utilizing this method from Laruelle but they haven't really let go of that, what I call the principle sufficient of appeal to authority. Sure, you yeah. Know, like it's yeah, yeah. sort of like appeal to authority that like one gives, but really Laurel says it best and Laurel does not exist. You know, his authority does not exist, you know. But that again is like an authority telling you that he does not exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? It undoes that. <laughs> it undoes that. So it, it, it doesn't reach that kind of conclusion for a lot of the... Um, the people that are very much involved with this so yeah um the thing is with me um and i'm also a part of the problem uh since i'm an academic uh, journal editor for oraxium a journal of non-philosophy um i forgot to mention that earlier but that's the plug <laughs> um but like uh like the 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 idea of um a non-academic, a militant, or a heretic, or like approach. What does that mean? What does that look like? And yeah. all these other things, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have a visage. It doesn't have like an appearance. Like it's about undoing that appearance, um, changing that kind of like thing in the first place. So, um, I'd say that there's a lot to be done, a lot to be uh, uh, you know questioned, and a lot to be. Um, um, taken up, yeah, and I've yet to see that. I mean, the reception for Laura Well in the Anglophone acad- academia has kind of been like <laughs> for the past decade, you know, lumped in with speculative realism and everything yeah. like that. So, um, 
it has yet to see its own day mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a lens that is not supposed to be like another Deleuzian century or a Laurelian century or anything like that. It's how does one actually fucking develop a century where we all are in the same position? Yeah. We're all fucked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and how do we, uh, how do we change that with the power that we have? Sure. And it's, it's the notion of a last refuge. As yeah. Or, no, it's, it's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, I, I got the same vibe from yeah. it as well. Yeah. Uh, in different words, uh, <laughs> because I didn't, wouldn't be, have been able to put it like that, obviously. Mm. Um, but yeah, anything else about non-philosophy that uh, is irking you? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot that irks me, and <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah. How about this? We'll continue on with generic science, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you know there's enough overlap there that anything that you think of, mm -hmm. you know, will will come deal up. with it. Yeah. So then we'll okay. okay. For anyone that listened to this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and you know how to leave comments. So please do it. I don't care if you subscribe or any of that, that crap. Just leave comments. That's what's important. I'm going to leave links. What links should I leave? For Araxium? Uh, like for other things? Yeah, so um, you can look on Facebook. Um, Araxium Journal for Non-Philosophy. We also have a website, Araxium.org. Yeah. Um, that will lead us to the uh, uh, splash page where we have our, um, we still have like a call for papers up, but we've already received our submissions for it. Uh, sure. So we're still like in the uh, peer review period. That's a nightmare. <laughs> oh my God, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can probably see our mission statement and all these other things. So we, we, we're, we have a lot of projects upcoming for that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, like, uh, yeah, just, just look around, read some non-philosophy, and if you have any questions, uh, um, you can shoot me an email yeah. through my Western email. It's jsmit747 at uwo.ca. Cool. I'll put that in the description, the description as well. Yeah. Uh, all right, great. Great. So we'll catch you again next time. Peace.